All right, as we get started today, a couple things. As you can see, Jesse's still not here. I'm not sure where he is. Hoping that he comes today. Um, I have not graded your, your homeworks. They will be graded. You'll get them back no later than Monday. All right, and I should, by Sunday, have the grades in the, uh, in the book. What I've decided I'm going to do is I'm going to take this slow because I, I what I what I was going to do is go over chapter nine today, slam an example on you, get all that done by 10:30, give you an hour of lab. Then tomorrow do the same thing with chapter 10. And my guess is you're going to find this harder than anything we've done so far. All right. So what I've decided to do is to go over chapter nine today. And after we go over chapter nine, I, I'm actually I've done two of the three um, examples that are in the book. All right, I'm going to try to do the other one during your first break. And then after the break, you know, and if we need more time, and because it's, this is a kind of a long chapter, so it might take two, you know, whatever, uh, I will send out the test reviews for chapters 9 and 10, and we'll go over that. We'll go over the review questions at the end of the chapter like we always do. All right, and then we'll take a look at those two or those three um, examples that are in the book. I will make sure that, um, let's see how, I don't think they're very big. Let me double check here. Yeah, it's, it's not even a meg. So with the first two and with the last one, it'll probably be around a meg. So I'll be able to email those to you during the break and then we can look at them. All right, and what what we'll do then is I'm going to tell you at the end of the period what your homework will be. There's three problems I'd like you to do for Chapter 9. We'll do one of the three tomorrow morning. All right, that's what we'll do first thing. And um, I don't know which one yet. I'm not asking for input. I'm going to decide tonight when I get home which one I feel like doing. All right. The guy who does my taxes for me, I'm trying to get, get a hold of him. And if I can get a hold of him, I've got to go in and see the tax guy tonight. So, I, you know, I'll get one of them done. All right. And maybe I'll even help you with two of them. We'll see how it goes. And then, um, and then tomorrow, like I said, we'll do that. And then after that, you'll have lab for the rest of the period. And then we'll do something very similar to that on Monday. And what I meant... Or what I mean by that is we'll go over the stuff for Chapter 10. We'll look at some of the examples that are in the chapter itself, etc. And then Tuesday, we'll go over, you know, I'll give you a two or three to do, and we'll do one of them on Tuesday. Does that make sense? Then Wednesday of next week, all right, and I know I'm, I'm just shooting way ahead in the future, but Wednesday of next week, we'll do the hands-on for Chapter 9. Thursday, we'll do the hands-on for Chapter 10. And then probably Friday, we will have some kind of a, uh, a pretest for you. And I'll give you the whole period to work on it. And then we'll kind of do it as a class on, you know, we're off that next Monday. That's President's Day. So that Tuesday, we'll do it as a class. And then Wednesday, which is like two weeks from yesterday, something like that, the 21st, I think it is, we'll take the hands-on test. All right. I will tell you. That when we get to the next, after we do 9 and 10, you know, here's a surprise. After 9 and 10, we go into Chapter 11. All right. But Chapter 11 isn't nearly as hard. It's on exception handling. It's different, but you'll see it. All right. Chapter 12, we're going to go through and we're just going to blaze through that because all it is is this is a text box. This is a label. This is a list box. So we'll go through that very quickly in one period. Then when we get done, we'll have a little bit more time to spend on Chapter 13, which is on events. In chapter 14, my goal is still, and we'll see if it works or not, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. But in an ideal world, all right, uh, in an ideal world, by the time we break, we'll, we'll either be done with a book or darn close to being done with a book, all right? And I will let you know, I mean, sometimes during the break, you know, with, with some of you, you might say, you know what, during the break, I'm not even going to turn on my frickin' computer. I get that. It's not a problem. But sometimes people like to get a little bit ahead. So I will show you, you know, before we go on that break, which is March 12th through the 16th, so what would that make it? The 9th, that Friday, I'll do some work with you, all right? 
and uh, I'll show you what we'll be doing after the break. All right. Two more things, and we're going to start. First thing is next. What day is it? It's Wednesday or Thursday of next week. Um, next Wednesday. I don't know if you've ever seen these. We're having what's called a shadow attack here. What that means is, as of right now, I have one student. They have two students next door. We're going to have a student's going to come in here and sit in for the entire class. All right? So what I'm planning on doing, and we're going to do this from start to finish, all right, um, is we're going to build literally, you know what the magic eight ball is, right? You know, everybody knows. We're going to build that as a class. We're going to spend the whole period, just take our time, kind of go through a lot of the stuff that we've been doing, all right, or that we've done in the past. Now, since that's the 14th, and I told you on that day we'd have one of those uh, written tests, we won't. We'll have it the next day. It's not a big thing, all right? But that student, we're supposed to keep them engaged, all right? So I, I don't know how we'll do it. We'll probably have them sit between a couple of you. I mean, the, the, the guy or gal is not going to have their own computer with them, but the, yet they're supposed to feel involved. So maybe I'll put, it, you know, put him or her there or there or whatever, all right? And maybe you can let them do a little bit of the work, you know, yourselves. And then finally, geez. Um, when is that? They're really pushing us that they're going to have two groups in Friday, March 2nd from 8.30 till 12.30 from Wentzville South Middle School. And they'd like programs to provide a hands-on experience for students. All make sense? All right. What I'm thinking of doing is volunteering us for that. And then what we do, you'll have already built that uh, that, that example program, I'm going to have them create it. Not using your machines. We'll have to get C-sharp loaded on each one of these machines because there'll be about 20 students. So that day, for lack of better words, you're not going to be doing a hell of a lot because you're going to be walking around helping students. Does that make sense? All right. And we, we do this usually once or twice a semester. You know, and you might, you know, cause sometimes students, well, that isn't fair. We're losing a whole, whole damn day. Well, yeah, but it, it's good for the school. You know, they have actually charted it, and they've ended up getting people who've ended up coming to Rankin because of this. So that's that's what they'd like to do. So I'm, I'm going to volunteer to do that. All right. So as we start, Chapter 9, which starts on page 353, is on a topic that's called Object-Oriented Programming. All right? What we've done so far, okay, is... Basically, we've written what's referred to as procedural programming, okay? And we've created data, and we've created functions or methods that operate on that data, okay? And that's, you know, that a lot of programming languages work like that. But you may or may not realize it, when, I, when we go through some of this stuff today, you're going to be like, this is just really weird. Why can't we just go back to what we were doing? And I would argue with you and say, you're already doing object-oriented programming. Because every time that you come into here, and I don't know if you're aware of this or not, okay? But every single time that you come in here and you start up a new project, so I'm just going to come in and start up a new project. It'll be a GUI. I'm just going to keep the Windows Form application name. That's fine. But when you come in here, again, this is... Telling you this is may or may not be a way you've ever thought of this. All right. But if you come out here and you take a button and you just drag it on a form, nothing big, you know what that is, etc. All right. But what you just did, literally, or what I did by doing that, is we created what's called a button object. And a button object is part of the button class. So if I put another button out here, you can see the difference between them. One says one says button one and one says button two. But the point is that if I click on button one and you see all this stuff that's in here, and I click on button two and you see all the stuff that's in here, it's identical except for two things, three things. One is the name's different. That name is button one. That name is button two. That's one difference. 
Another one is that one physically uh, is located here at uh, location 9873. This one is, is at location 98144. And the other difference between them is the text. One says button one, one says button two. But other than that, they're identical to one another. All right. In other words, the rest of these things that are here in your properties window, all the rest of those properties are identical to one another. So we created two different button objects from the button class. All right. And if you still don't get it, imagine it this way. Let's assume that right across the street here from Rankin that there's a vacant lot and it's it's huge. All right. And some developer comes in and buys it and decides that they can fit 100 homes on this big lot. And they're going to make five, you know, they have five different house models. They're going to go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, 20 times. Everybody understand that? All right. Each one of those house models would be referred to as a house class. So you'd have five different classes. One might be a two-story. One might be a ranch. One might have, you know, an exposed basement, etc. All right. And then if they make 20 different houses based off of each one of those plans, those become house objects. So object oriented programming, the idea is you see everything in terms of objects. If you're still confused, you're all people objects. So if I made a class called person, I could put in there things like height, weight, uh, gender, eye color, hair color, etc. If I put those five things in there, all right? And then I, I would put in what are called methods, which we typically have been calling like functions, but I could make an eat and a sleep and a drink. And then I could make, based on the ones of you who are, the, those of you who are here, I could make seven person objects. I could make a Matthew object. I could make an Evan object, etc. You'd all have a height, a weight, an eye color, a hair color, and a gender. All right, but the chances are that no two of you would have the exact same things for every one of those properties. Does that make sense? And if I said, you know, eat, drink, let's say eat, drink, and sleep, okay, those three things. My guess is you won't, you don't all sleep the same amount, you don't all drink the same things, you don't all eat the same things. But the idea is there's a commonality between you, and that's what the whole topic of object-oriented programming is about. They say there that it's a paradigm. If you don't know what a paradigm is, it's a shift in thinking. All right? And, you know, when you think about it, there have been a lot of paradigms that have happened throughout history. I'm not, this is not a history class. But even the computer itself was a paradigm shift. I remember, you know, being, you know, this is how old I am, all right? I graduated from high school before a lot of you were born. Probably everybody in here were born. I graduated from high school in 1974, D during the, and that was like in May or June of 74. But that year, in about January, our school got its first computer. All right? It was as wide as this room is. All right? And about maybe from there to about that table. That's how big it was. All right? They had to bring it in pieces so they could put it together. And everybody thought, wow, is that cool? They turned it on. You couldn't even, if you were walking in the hallway, you couldn't even talk. It was so loud. So you can see over time how, how much things have changed. All right? So what we're going to be working with, and what I just mentioned, eye color, hair color, etc. we call those, we can call them data, we can call them fields. Typically, we call those properties. And that works out nice because if you remember, what? That's our properties window right there. All right. And the other things that I mentioned, like eat, sleep, drink, those are called methods. All right. All a method is, is it's a function that's inside of a class. So you might hear the word function. We talked about functions in JavaScript last semester. All right. So all a method is basically is it's a function that's inside of a class. All right. Now, I just went out to Wikipedia. There's all sorts of stuff out here. But that's our, that's enough to at least get us started. All right? So what are we going to do? We're going to learn about class concepts. Some of these I've already told you. 
when you create an object based off of a class, like when we, if you create one of those houses based off of one of those house plans, or I create a Matthew object based off of a person class, that's called instantiating an object. All right, you're creating an instance. So we'll learn how to create objects. We'll learn how to give those objects properties, including what they call auto-implemented properties. And before you say that, just sounds weird. It's real simple, and it actually involves a lot less work if you do it the way that they show it in the book. All right. Then we'll talk about public and private access modifiers. We've worked a little bit with them, but we haven't really talked about what they're about. Then we're going to talk about a keyword. That actually is a keyword, the word this. The good news is everything that you learn in these two chapters Everything that you learn in these two chapters is pretty much what we're going to be going over all over again in spring of 2019 when we talk Java. All right? And, and you, you hopefully at that time you go, oh, I remember doing this. Okay? All right. Then we'll talk about a special kind of method that's called a constructor, how we can use things called object initializers, how we can overload operators. You know how we overloaded a method? You can overload operators. All right. What do you mean overload operators? You can make the plus sign do something, the minus sign do something, etc. We'll see an example of that in the chapter. All right. Declare object arrays. We've talked about arrays. We So far we've had an array of ints or an array of doubles or an array of strings, etc. You can have an array of objects. All right. We'll talk about that. When you create an object, you automatically call the object's constructor. When an object goes away, it automatically calls the object's destructor. All right? And then finally, as it says, we'll talk about the GUI application objects. That's what I already mentioned to you. Okay? So, like I said, this is not meant to be, oh, my God, this doesn't make any freaking sense at all. But the idea is this is how the author comes at it, and many people do it this way. The author says, like, when you're a little kid, all right, and, you know, I, I look, for example, at my granddaughter, who's eight months old. She already can say, she, she's starting to say, mom, 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 but I, we don't know if she means mama or she's just saying that. All right. Her dad is sure that she said da, 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 but nobody's ever heard it but him. All right. But the funny thing is the other thing she says is Emmy. They've got a dog that's named Remington. And they call him Remy. So they think that's, that's one word that she says. So the other, what I'm getting to is she's associated looking at him with Emmy. All right? It makes some sense to her. All right? In much the same way, and the author mentions this, if I said to you, hey, do you like, do you, I don't even know how to pronounce that, but do you like an okapi? Let's, let's say that's how you pronounce it. And you'd say, I don't know. I don't know what the hell it is. If I say it's an animal you at least can start conceiving in your mind, okay, it either flies or it has four legs or both or it does this or it does that, etc. All right? So the author is saying that when you start looking at this, you start looking at everything in terms of classes. And that's what object-oriented programming is about. All right? For example, again, you're all person, person objects of a person class. This is a desk object from a desk class, etc. All right. So as they mentioned, classes are the building blocks of object-oriented programming. It says you already understand the difference exists. You've already used these classes. You've used the string class. You've used different number classes. All right. So we've used some of this stuff already. So. Here are some concepts. When you instantiate an object, that means that you create an object based off of a class. All right. So if you still don't get it, we're going to be looking at some code in just a minute. All right. It's the same code that's in the book. I've done the first two, gotten them to work, although I couldn't get the second one to work the way she did it. I had to do it my own way, but that's fine. We'll, we'll, go, we'll go into that in just a bit. All right. So an object is called an instance of a class. <clears throat> A class is a blueprint. An object is an example of that blueprint. All right? 
or an instance, whatever you want to call it. The decomponents that go in there, as it says, they're called instance variables. I mentioned to you before, if I came in and did this, this is literally how we're going to do it. All right? Let's write a little bit over here. We're going to say something like class person. All right? Then inside of here, we'll put like int height, int weight, string, eye color, string, hair color, string, gender. Then we'll add some more stuff in here, but the point is each one of these is going to be specific. So if I created seven different person objects, each one of you could conceivably have a different height and or a different weight and or a different eye color and or a different hair color and or a different gender. Does that make sense? These things right here are called instance variables. So each time I create an object or an instance, each object will have their own values for this. All right? Methods that are associated with objects have instance methods. The example that the author uses here is they say, if I walk up to you and say, hey, I'm having a graduation party for the second year students. Okay? Not. But let's just say that I was going to. And I said, uh, and, and you might say, well, or why you tell me this? Am I invited? When is it? Etc. But immediately, when I say I'm going to have a graduation party, you certain things spring into your mind. Okay, when's it going to be? Where is it going to be? What time is it going to be at? Etc. Things like that. So you can associate things with it. So the author says, well, when you start to come up with methods for that, then you have to start thinking. Okay, send out invitations, get RSVPs order booze, etc. Things like that. All right. So, when you start to come in here and you start to create a class, as it says here on page 356, you begin by creating a class header or a class definition that starts the class. Notice it contains three parts. The first one is optional. You know what optional means. That means you don't have to put it in. If you put it in, you say either public or you say private or you say protected or you say internal. I will tell you right now that no one ever says internal because that's the default. So if you put nothing there, it's like you put the word internal. Okay. So what's the difference between those? Well, that's shown in the table that you see on the bottom of page 356. Public means not only can you use the stuff that's in your program, but other people can use it also. It's public, kind of like stuff that's in the public domain. All right. Private means that your class can use it, All right. but that's it. That's the only thing that can literally use it. All right, or directly use it. Protected, this is something we talk about in the next chapter. So this is chapter 10 stuff. In chapter 10, we're going to talk about inheritance. And I may have given you this example. I know that the second year people are probably sick of hearing the example. But typically, the way that it works in life is if a guy marries a woman, and they both have a really big nose, and they have a baby, chances are pretty good that baby will have a big nose. Doesn't always happen. But it normally does. So what can the baby do about it as it grows up? Two things, right? Have a nose job, all right, or live with it. Okay? Most most of us live with it. It's not like you can sit there and and when you know with inheritance, you can't say, Wow, I wish I had a different nose. Take yours off and put another one on. But that is what you can do in a programming language with inheritance. If you don't like what you've inherited what you've inherited, you can override it and make your own. Okay, we'll get to that in the next chapter. But when something is protected, it's available to you and to all your children and all their children and all their children, etc. So as it goes down the family tree. 
All right. The other one is if you put nothing there, it's called internal access. Notice it says there access is limited to the assembly in which it belongs. An assembly is basically a group of a, a bunch of code that's together together will create a program. Again, if you don't understand that, you're going to see it in just a couple minutes. All right. Again, if you do not explicitly put one of these in, if you put none of them in, it defaults to internal. So the first example we're going to see is it's going to say class employee. All right. But if you say class employee, it's like saying internal class employee. But no one uses the word internal because that's what the default is. All right, so as here's your first time that you've seen a class. Now, there's absolutely nothing in it. But you say there, class, and then the name of the class. That's it. And then inside of curly braces, you put all the stuff that belongs to that class. So let's start adding some stuff. Well, here. Here we're saying that all employees have an ID number. We're going to build on this class tomorrow. We're going to build one of these ourselves. We've been doing a payroll thing, right? And we've given person, people first names, last names, maybe a social security number, an hour's worked, and an hourly rate, stuff like that. We're going to do that tomorrow. But we're going to put that into a, a basically, we'll just call it an employee class. Okay? Then what we'll do next week is we'll say, hey, at a company, you might have different kinds of employees. There might be hourly employees. There might be commission employees. There might be piece worker employees, etc. So we'll get into that next week. All right, just so you know what's kind of what's coming up. Now what they're saying is, and this is, you're not going to find this in any book, but to me, if somebody said to me, okay, you keep talking about this object-oriented programming that's called OOP. There's actually a book out there called The Poop on OOP. All right, but. Um, if somebody says, in a nutshell, in a few words, can you tell me what object-oriented programming is? This is what I would tell them. It's using public methods to manipulate private data. So what is that about? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's my seven-word definition of what object-oriented programming is. So in a nutshell, we're going to be using public methods, and we're going to manipulate private data. All right? And there's reasons that you do that. That is the object-oriented credo, so to speak. It also allows us to do this information hiding that we talked about before. All right? And it says, you do all that every day. We've already talked about this. And they say there, the benefit of making data items private is you have the ability to control their values. So we're going to make our data private, like they show right here. Then we're going to make public methods, and only those public methods can directly manipulate that private data. So we've got some control. All right. So the only way you're going to be able to change that ID number is by using a method that was written to change the ID number. That's the only way to do it. If you try to do it any other way, it won't work. You're going to get an error message in the program. And that's what they're saying here. So if we look, they keep expanding on this. This is a stupid example. All right. But what we have in here is both, and this is on page 358, there is both a data member or you know, a property ID number and there's a method called welcome message all right right now it does you know I would look at that and I go why the hell would I even want to do that that's just stupid all right and if you run this right now it's going to say welcome from employee and it'll say zero because we haven't given it a value and then it'll say how can I help you notice it's exactly I, th I thought they showed it here no nope, they don't all right you'll have to take my word for it but one thing about this, and this is one thing I want you to start keeping in mind. When you create variables like this under a class, do not ever initialize them. Did you hear me? Don't say private int ID number equals zero. 
don't do that. We're going to have a special function or method that you're going to see in just a couple minutes called a constructor. That's where you initialize these. All right. And again, it's kind of like, you know, you, 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 know you, you go to work someplace. Kind of like when I came to Rankin, to be honest with you. And they started saying to me, after I got hired, that's when I learned really about all their rules. I didn't realize when I got hired here I'd have to wear a Rankin shirt every day. I didn't realize that, that literally the way that it works here, if I would come into work one day and not shave my neck and Charles was having a bad day, he could, he could tell me either, hey, I've got a razor here, either go shave your neck or go home and shave your neck. And I say, if I say, well, I don't want to, then he'd say go home and stay there. All right. And I'm not saying I always understand those rules or I always agree with those rules, but that's the way they are. And it's the same way in here. There's a set of rules that you are expected to follow if you want to write true object-oriented programs. The other thing, too, is pretty much, pretty much, other than when we'll need a main, we're going to end up writing a different file now. Okay, the file will have only code in it. Guess what? It won't have the word static in it. All of the methods that we create in this class file, they'll be non-static. The reason we've been using static so far is when you use static, you don't need to have a class. In chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, we did nothing with classes. In 9 and 10, we will start working with classes. All right. They talk about this composition. Let's just hold off on that for now. We will get into it. All right. When you declare a class, you're, it's like you're declaring a blueprint. Okay? Again, like the, the example I gave you before with a house. Just because I can hold up this blueprint and show it to you doesn't mean you can climb inside and start living there. All right? It's just a blueprint for what the house is supposed to look like. In much the same way, when we came back there and we declared those classes earlier, like on the previous page, this, that does not create a class. All right? It, 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 I shouldn't say it does not create an object of a class. This is a blueprint. That's all it is. So what we have to do is to create an object based on that blueprint. All right? So they start coming in here and saying, here's an example. So I could do either this, where I put in two lines, or I can do this. Now, you've sort of seen this before. We use the word new with arrays. And guess what? An array in any language is a class. You've been working with the array class. How do I know that? Because it has methods. You've used array.source, array.reverse. You've used those before. So you've already been using methods of an existing class. What we're talking about in this chapter is writing your own methods and your, to use in your own properties to use in your own classes. All right? Now, when you work with these, remember we talked, with, talked about this, and you had to even do some of this on your test. We talked about references, and references were, were what? They were addresses, basically. All right, so when you passed a reference, you weren't passing the thing itself. You were passing the address of where it lived. Well, when you work with objects and you work with object-oriented programming, everything you do involves refs, but you don't need to use the word ref. When you pass an object into a routine, you pass the address to where the object lives. You can return an object from a routine. Only one or, a, or an array of them. But remember, you can only return zero or one thing. So back a little bit ago, we said, right, where was it? Here, there we go. Okay, so this class called employee has one piece of data. It's an ID number. All right, this class has one method. It's called welcome message. That's all it has. It's like if I create if I create a person object, and I, I give you that stuff I had up there before, those five things, height, weight, eye color, hair color, and gender. And I say a person can eat, a person can drink, and a person can sleep. That's all a person can do. 
literally. So they can eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, but they can't relieve themselves because we didn't give the ability to do that. So when, when you create an object based off of a class that you created, those objects can only do what you specified they could do inside of the classes. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You know, and a natural question, because I've had this asked before, you know, where somebody's raised their hand, I said, yeah. And they're like, okay, why? What? Why? Why the hell are we even learning this? Why can't we just do it the way we've been doing it? All right. And I will tell you that the best answer I can give you is when you learn how to do this, all right, what you get out of this more than anything else is the ability to reuse code. Now, code reuse is not a, not a term that any of you that want to be programmers, it's not a good term for you. Because every time you can reuse something, that means that that's less for you to do. But management loves the word reuse because cha-ching, cha-ching, they start thinking, okay, we can save money. So object-oriented programming languages in many ways are more popular than non-object-oriented programming languages. All right. When you do this, when you give, so we, made, we created an object called my assistant. So after the my assistant and after the period that you see there, you can put either my assistant dot welcome message or you can say my assistant dot ID number, you know, where you set their ID number. That's it. That's all that you can do because that's all that you've given it the ability to do. Right here, this line that you see, employee my assistant equal new employee. That's creating an employee object named my assistant. Sometimes people get confused if you look up on the screen here. Notice the word employee appears both on the left-hand side of the equal sign and on the right-hand side of an equal sign. On the left-hand side, it's telling the type of data that it is. This is something new of type employee. Its name is my assistant. This is saying I want to instantiate or create an instance of that class. All right. Right now, if we did it, that's all that it would do. Create employee. Wow. Okay. You can, as I mentioned before, notice what they're doing here. They're creating two objects, one called a worker, one called another worker. Then they're passing those objects to a routine. So you can pass an entire object, all right, as an actual parameter into a method. That's what they're doing here. Totally legit to do that. And again, you're going to be doing this stuff. Not only can you pass one in, you can return, again, an entire object from a routine. Totally legit. All right. So let's talk about those things that go in, are inside of them, the property, so to speak. And again, I go back to this. I showed you this before. These right here, make this bigger. Try to make that bigger. All that stuff that you see in here, those are all the properties of that button. If I go to here, same stuff except for the three things I told you. If I go to the form, those are all the properties of a form. So there is a form class, and these are the properties of this form. All forms have these properties. The values that we have inside of here as far as the width, the height, the name, those can all be different. Just like all of you, like I mentioned before, you all have a height, you all have a weight, you all have an eye color, you all have a hair color, all right? You all have a gender. So as it says, frequently methods that you call with an object are used to alter the states of fields. All right? So if I'm going to create an employee, I probably want to be able to change their ID number. Notice what kind of method it is. Everybody see this? Public. Public. But the only this this data right there, that was defined as being private. So the only way I can change this private data is by using this public method. As I mentioned, that's pretty much the hallmark of object-oriented programming. It is possible to have private methods. 
It is possible to have public data. They're going to show you public data later. You almost never, ever do it. There really should never be a reason to do it. I don't even agree with the way that they did it here, but they did it. So what's a property? It's a member of a class that provides access to a field of a class. Properties are fields. All right. Like public methods, they protect private data from outside access. Okay. Now, this is what we're going to end up doing. And there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. Okay. I want everybody to look at this. This is in the book on page 364. And you see the stuff there that's in gray. Literally, just so you know, you may care, you may not, these are called getters. These are called setters. All right. These are also called accessors. These are also called mutators. Okay. And I may have mentioned this to you before. Again, I don't remember the classes overlap after a while. It's the first day of class for a first semester. In fact, this happened with the two of you. You know, you guys came in, basically introduced yourselves to me, but, okay, so it's the first day of class. Josh comes in, and I say, hey, what, how you doing? He said, fine. And he said, uh, are you Mr. Scott? And I say, yes. And I say, what's your name? And he says, Josh. Well, that's a get name. He is, I'm accessing his name. If I say, no, we already have three Joshes in here. From now on, I'm calling you Jim. All right, which would be stupid, but you get the idea. That's a set. All right. It's like when you're born, that's really with, with, because in here, unless any of you plan on ever changing your names, all right, when you were born, that's the only time you had a set name. Now, when women choose their husbands, take their husband's name when they get married, they may do it twice. They may do it several times if they, you know, if they get divorced or whatever. But really, like with us, the only time our name was set probably was when we were born. All right. On the other hand, there might have been many times in your life when you were doing something that someone asked you your name. That's an accessor. But when your name was set in the hospital or whatever, that was a mutator or a setter. All right. So much of the work that you end up doing in here, every time that you create a piece of data, you typically give it a getter and a setter. Now, if you look in here, we're not doing anything special. Get just means return it. And set just means this is a special keyword called value. And I want to show you something. If you all look on the screen here, because this code that you see right here, all of that code, what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines. You can also write like this. As long as you're, if, if you're not changing the stuff that's in there, you can write those eight lines like this because it's built into the C-sharp language. When we get to Java a year from now, you can't do that in Java, but you can do it in C-sharp. It's just kind of nice because it, it ends up you writing a lot less code. That's what's nice about it. But if I want to come in here and if I want to say, for example, to set the ID number, let's say the ID number has to be between 1,000 and 10,000. You know how to do that. You've already done stuff like that before. So we'd have an if statement in here. All right. Then I can't do this. I have to actually write code. Okay. And if you don't understand what I mean, again, you're going to be seeing this as we go on. So let's go through a couple more pages and we'll take a break. And I'm looking at your faces and you're like, oh, man, God, thanks, thanks for giving us a break. This is about as dry as it gets in here. All right. This is not exciting stuff. We got to go over it before it'll make sense. All right. And you're probably like, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of listening. All right. But you'll have to because the next test that you take, all right, the next test that you take will be very similar to the employee examples that we're going to do for 9 and 10. All right. And if you can understand those, you should be, and I talk about the next hands on test. All right. I will tell you because a couple of you have asked me about the tutor. All right. It's Ethan. All the paperwork has been sent over to 
St. Louis. I've got to try to get a hold of Keith Morton, who's the guy in charge of it this afternoon. As soon as he says, yeah, he can start, Ethan's going to start coming in here every day that we have a lap. Okay? And he's willing to work with people individually. He'll take a bunch of you as a group. Now, it'll be kind of tough because some of you, you know, don't maybe like it when there's a lot of noise in here on a lab day. What I'm going to ask is, like, let's, let's assume that you two want, to, uh, want some help. That you just go off into a, one of the corners and work. You know, he's not a very, he, he's a very soft-spoken guy. All right? And he's funny as hell, too, because he's got a really dry sense of humor. All right. All right. So those are our getters and our setters. If we have a get, so if we do this, so Im imagine for a second, come on, give me, there you go. Imagine we had this get, but we didn't have this set. So imagine that set was not here. All right, we have just a get. That means that something is read only. All right, if we have a set, but we don't have a get, that means something is write only. All right, and you might say write only, who the hell would ever do that? Remember those out parameters that we did on your test? Those were write only. All right. Okay. I already mentioned this about these auto implemented properties, how you can do this. So the author says, hey, you can take all those lines and you can change them to this, or you can even do this, or the easiest is to even do this. That's what I just put on the board for you just a minute ago. Those are called auto-implemented properties. So if there's nothing special that you have to do for a get or a set, you can do it like this, which means since it's called an auto-implemented property, the system knows what to do. You don't even have to tell it anything. It just plain knows what it is it should do. So they show you an example of this on page 369. This is the same example that you see in the book here. So notice we're creating a brand new object right here. It's called a worker. All right? And that worker has got an ID number with a get and a set and a salary with a get and a set. So we can come up here in main and say a worker dot. Okay? We're going to take a break, but before we do, I just want to say one more thing. This is an asinine way to write a program. What the author showed you here is an asinine way of doing this. I can't think of any reason that you should put your main in the same file as your class. So even though that's what the author does in here, that's not what your instructor does. Okay? So what, we're, what you're going to see after we take a break, all right, is we're going to go over the example that is in the book. And this is the one that is in the book, the You Do It, on pages 370, 371, 372, and 373. I don't normally do this. But for this topic, topic rather, and you're going to get the stuff, I just have to finish rewriting number three. And as soon as I finish that, I'll just email this to all of you. So you all have this working code. So just about nine, let's take a healthy break. Please come back at 915.